we're ready to talk now about advanced methods of smoothing. Remember the add one smoothing that we had earlier. Um, in add one smoothing, we add one to the numerator and v to the denominator. And we saw a generalization of that, add k smoothing, where we added k to the numerator and kv to the denominator. And we can modify that slightly. We can create a new version where we simply replace, um, uh, introduce a new, a new term, new variable m equals kv. And now we have a new, um, a new way of writing add k smoothing. Um, that is going to be a, a, a helpful way of writing it. And the reason is, let's see on the next slide, that when we write, um, write it this way, we can see that what we're doing is adding to every bigram, we're adding a constant that's related to 1 over the vocabulary size. And instead of doing that, we could add a constant related to the unigram probability of the word that we're backing off to. So the um, unigram prior smoothing algorithm is an is a extension to add k that says instead of using 1 over v as our to add to every, um, adding some function of 1 over v to every bigram count, let's add something about the um, unigram probability. So really, unigram prior is a kind of interpolation. It's a, it's a variant of interpolation where we're adding a count and, um, and some function of the unigram probability to the bigram count. Nonetheless, although unigram prior smoothing works well, it, it, still not well it, wasn't, it still doesn't work well enough to be used for language modeling. Nonetheless, despite the fact that unigram prior smoothing works well, it doesn't work well enough to be used for language modeling. Instead, the intuition used by many smoothing algorithms, good Turing smoothing, knesser nye smoothing, Witten-Bell smoothing, is to use the count of things we've seen once to estimate the count of things we've never seen. The goal of a smoothing algorithm is to replace those unseen zeros with something else. And all these algorithms say, look at the things you've seen once. Things that you saw once before are just like things that you haven't seen yet, and then you're going to see them once in the test set. So to see how this intuition works, we're going to introduce some notation. And we're going to, the notation we're going to introduce is uh, big N sub C, and that will mean the frequency of frequency C, meaning how many things occurred with frequency C. How big is the bin of things that occurred with frequency C? And that's hard to, um, to it's not very intuitive, so let's look at some intuitions. So let's take a little sentence, Sam I am, I am Sam, I do not eat. And let's just look at the unigram counts in there. So we have I occurring three times, Sam occurring twice, and do not and eat occurring once each time. So what is n sub 1? How many things occur one time? Well, here they are. There are three of them. Three different word types occur one time. So n sub, three, sub 1 is 3. How about how many things occur two times? Well, there's two of those. So n sub 2 is 2. And how about things that occur three times? Well, only one of those happens. So n sub 3 is 1. All right, so now that we have the intuition about how to think about frequencies of frequencies, let's apply this to get the intuition for good Turing smoothing. Imagine you're fishing. This is a scenario invented by Josh Goodman. And you've caught 10 carp, 3 perch, 2 whitefish, 1 trout, 1 salmon, and 1 eel. I don't know what kind of river or stream or ocean this could be, but nonetheless, you've caught 18 fish. And I, we want to estimate how likely is it that the next species is trout. And it's just like words. We have maybe a word that's occurred 10 times or 3 or 2 or 1. We want to know how likely is that are these ones to occur again. Well, there's been 18 fish. Trout's occurred one time out of 18. So the probability ought to be 1 out of 18. But now, Let's ask, how likely is it that the next species is a new species, catfish or bass, some species we haven't seen before, something that occurred zero times? Well, the good Turing intuition says, let's use our estimate of things we saw once to estimate these new things we've never seen before. So what's our estimate of things once? Our estimate of thing once is drawn from n sub 1. How many things occurred once? Well, what's n sub 1? n sub 1 is 3. So out of the 18 things we saw, three of them were, new, were things that only occurred one time. 
So let's use 3 out of 18 as our estimate for things that, that we've never seen before. We're going to use our estimate of things, that, uh, our count of things that we've seen once as our estimate of things that we've never seen before. We're going to reserve some probability mass for all those unseen things. Well now, if we do that, if we use um, 3 out of 18 as our estimate for uh, all the unseen things we could possibly see, how likely is it that the next species is trout? Well, I already asked you that question, but before I said 1 over 18, but that can't be true anymore. It must be less than 1 over 18 because we've used some of our probability mass for the, from the original 18 fish. We've saved some of that for these new fish that we've never seen before. We've removed 3 eighteenths of our probability mass, and so we now have to, have to um, discount all of our probabilities for the other uh, fish downward a little bit. How are we going to estimate what this discount factor is? How much should we reduce all of these counts? Here's the uh, equation for good Turing. Here's the answer to that question. Good Turing tells us that um, the probability for things that we've never seen before, p star for things with zero frequency, is exactly what we used on the previous slide n sub 1, the count of things that have occurred with frequency 1 over n. So it's just the, the we saw 3 out of 18 was our number before. Well then what do you do with, um, with things that did, didn't occur with zero frequency? And for that we use the second part of the good Turing equation which says the new count c star, the good Turing count, is going to be n sub c plus 1 divided by n sub c times c plus 1. So Let's just work that out, and we'll, we'll, we'll give you an intuition for why this is in a second. Let's work, out the, um, work it out in a little example first. So unseen fish, let's say it's bass or catfish we hadn't seen before. In the training set, the maximum likelihood probability, estimated probability, is zero. We didn't see this in the training set out of zero words, so it's zero out of 18 or zero. But smoothed, we're going to use the new good Turing probability, and that says it's n1 out of n. n1 is 3. We saw 3 things once on the previous slide out of 18 things. And so the new probability is going to be 3 18 What about for something we've seen once, like trout? How are we going to re-estimate the trout? Well, the maximum likelihood estimate tells us that there was the count of 1. And so the maximum likelihood probability is 1 over 18. But the new good Turing formula here says the count of trout should be c, c is 1, c plus 1, so 2, times n sub 2 over n sub 1, and that's going to be 2 times 1 third, because n sub 2 is 1 from the previous slide, and n sub 1 is uh, 3, and 2 times 1 third, so 2 thirds. So our good Turing probability takes our c star from trout, and, and uh, and divides it by the 18 things we've seen, so it's 2 thirds slash 18 or 1 27th. So instead of the count of things we saw once before we had 1 over 18, and now we've dropped it to 2 thirds, 2 thirds over 18. So we've discounted our probability from 1 18th to only 2 thirds of an 18th. And we've used that extra discounted probability mass to account for the zero things we've never seen before. Let's look at the nice intuition for good Turing developed by Hermann Nye and his colleagues. Imagine the training set. This is of size C, and this will be a training set with words in it. Here's a word, here's another word, here's another word, here's another word. And now let's, we're going to hold out iteratively words from this training set. Let's first take one word, that first word there, the blue word, and we'll just write it over here. So now we'll think about the training set without that word, that's got C minus one words, and this one held out word over here, the blue word. And now let's do the same thing with a different word. Let's take out, let's say, the second word. So we still have C minus one, if we include this guy, C minus one words left in training, and then one more word over here in the held out set. And we'll do this C times, so each time we'll pull out one word. So we've pulled out words one by one, and what we've created is a held out set that's of size C, but each word in it was created from a training set that was missing that word. A training set of size C minus one minus that word. So imagine each of these words and their corresponding training sets. 
And we can look at a picture developed by Dan Klein to think about this, tree, this intuition. And here we've just turned those held out in training sets on their side. So I still have of length C, but I've now written them vertically. And now let's um, think about this intuition. I've got C training sets, each one of size C minus one. And then I have a, each one has a held out set of size one. And let's try to answer the question, what fraction of held out words are unseen in training? Well, these words, n sub zero, the words unseen in training, each word that's unseen in training occurred one time in the original training set before we removed, we took out each of our held out data. If there was a word and it occurred once in training, so it's in n sub one, occurred once in training, and we take it out of its training set, leaving c minus one words, then that word occurs zero times in its training set, the new training set, without that word. So the word, the held out words, um, n sub zero of them, those n sub zero words, were the words that were n sub one in their original training set before we removed them. So if we want to know how many words are unseen in the training, it's the words that occurred one time in the original training set, or n1 over c. Well, correspondingly, if we want to know, let me clear that up, what fraction of words are seen k times in training, let's pick a k, perhaps it'll be two, so we pick n sub two, then um, the number of things that occur two times in our held out set is the number of things that occurred three times in the original training before we removed one, one copy of each of those words. So now they occur only twice. So we need to think, if we want to know how many words occurred k times in training, to estimate that, it's really the words that occurred k plus one times in our original training set. And then we're going to want to, um, we're going to want to multiply that by, um, the number of words that occur, each of those words occurs um, k plus one time. So we have k plus one um, uh, word occurrences of the n sub k plus one bin, each of which has n sub k plus one words in it. And we'll express that as a fraction out of the total words c. Remember the total words are c. So that's the fraction of held out words seen k times in training. And um, that means in the future, we expect k plus one times n sub k plus one over c of the words to be those with training count k. And since there are n sub k words with training count k, we want to, this, this fraction, this probability, we want to distribute that over n sub k words. So we're, each of those n sub k words is going to occur with probability k plus one times n sub k plus one over c over n sub k, because we're distributing it over those words. And that means that the expected count, we multiply back by C again to turn from a fraction back into a count. The expected count of words that occur with training tau k, k sub star, is k plus 1 times the ratio of n sub k plus 1 over n sub k. One thing we talked about, we always compute the count n sub k from n sub k plus 1, but what do we do for words that are in fact the, mo the largest set, the k plus the largest number, let's say that the word the is in fact the word that occurred most frequently in the corpus, we don't have a more frequent word to estimate it from. So for large k, the, this good Turing estimator doesn't work well because there's lots of words that may never have occurred, let's say 4,418 times or even 3,722 times. We're going to have some gaps. And so, um, We'll have some, some zero, so the word, you know, maybe this is the word the, and this is some other word of, and there's a missing word in here, and there's missing words here, so we can't always use the n plus one word to do the estimation. And um, a simple replacement for that, in fact, an algorithm called simple good Turing, is after, uh, after the counts get unreliable, after the first, you know, first few counts, we just replace our estimator with some kind of a best fit power law. So we, we don't actually use um, good Turing with each of these um, higher order numbers. We just use them for the lower, lower bins. So let's look at the resulting good Turing numbers from one example. So here's numbers from um, a Church and Gale experiment where they use 22 million words of AP Newswire. Here's the, um, uh, just to remind you, here's the, the good Turing equation. So the count C star is C plus one times N C plus one over N C. So here's the original count, C. Um, here's, all, here's the zeros, now replaced by the good Turing estimator with a little extra probability mass from, from n sub 1. 
Here's the ones, the ones all turned into 0.446. All the things that occurred with count two now occur with count 1.26. All the things with count three occur with um, count 2.24. So each of our counts has been discounted. Each of these counts have been discounted to a, to a lower number to leave some room for the things with zero count. And the last thing I want to leave you on is, is asking you, what's the relationship between each of these counts, the original counts C, and these counts C star? Do you notice any general relationship?